Well, welcome and good afternoon. We would like to get started with our K-State Garden Hour series. Thank you for joining us today. This series is hosted by Kansas State Research and Extension. My name is Franny Miller and I am the Pesticide Safety and IPM Coordinator. Before we get started, we do have a couple of housekeeping notes. We are we have recently upgraded to a new Zoom webinar license, which has a question and answer feature for you to use to ask any questions. If you have any other comments or technical questions, you are more than welcome to just use the chat box. The question and answer is designed to capture questions related to the presentation. Our moderator is Kelsey Hattisall. She is the horticulture agent in the River Valley District. Our moderator will be keeping track of the questions that come in and we will do our best to get through all the questions at the end. In the event that we do not answer them all, we will be uploading additional resources for you on our horticulture and natural resources website. This will serve as a great reference after the presentation. You will also be able to access today's presentation on this website. Today's webinar will be recorded and we will post it to the website just previously mentioned. You can also find previous topics and upcoming topics at our website. Our moderator will send this link over in the chat. The events in this series have also been posted on the K-State Horticulture and Natural Resources Facebook page. You can stay tuned into what is going on with our department as well as stay up to date with upcoming topics within the series. Be sure to like, share, and use the hashtag K-State Garden Hour to help us promote this program. The webinar series has allowed us to continue to provide extension education related to horticulture and gardening, given the circumstances that we are all in today. Everyone involved in the development of the series is an extension professional for K-State. Most of us have a background in horticulture education or a related discipline. But most of all, we each have a love for gardening and the natural environment. Each week, we feature a new topic related to gardening and horticulture. Our goal is to meet the needs of new and seasoned gardeners. Today's topic is how to choose potting media for gardening success. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Cheryl Boyer. She serves as an extension specialist in nursery crop production and has a passion for digital delivery. Please give us a few minutes here as we transition. All right, can you all see that just fine for Annie? Yes. That's good. Yep. All right. So, hello, <laughs> and um, thanks for joining our webinar today. I'm excited that so many of you have uh, signed up to learn about potting media. So, my name is Cheryl Boyer. I have a PhD in horticulture, specifically in nursery crop production. And um, I, I, what I worked on for my doctoral program was alternative potting materials. And you would think it's a fascinating and exciting topic. But, uh, you know, I don't get a lot of questions about it. So I'm pretty excited to share with you some of the things that I know about um, nursery crop production and how that relates to potting media that you might be using in your garden and how you can think through making decisions. So towards the end, I'll show you this spring, I went out to um, a few of our local garden centers and looked at the bags of potting media and I realized, you know, there's really not a lot of information out there to help you make a decision or know what you're buying and uh, whether or not you're, you're throwing money away on something that's not going to meet your needs. So today we're going to walk through all of those things. And, um, but before we get started, I would like for you to take just a few seconds to fill out the poll. So hopefully it will be launched soon. There we go. We'll just take like 30 seconds. Have you ever read the label on a bag of potting media? Look at you guys. This is so fun. We're having fun with this webinar license. We keep learning new things about it and trying 
uh, all the different features as we go through. And while you're filling that out, you can look at the gorgeous photo behind, which are some new ornamentals that are on the market and um, they're, they're ready for landscapes this time of year. Okay, so 89% of you have voted and 70% of you say that you have read what's on the bag. Let's see what you were looking at. All right, I'm going to end this poll. Here's the results again. And stop sharing it. All right. So today what we're going to go over, um, just as an overview, we're going to understand what soil-less substrates are. So you're probably more familiar with that as uh, a potting media. Um, as a scientist, I tend to use the word substrate because it's a little bit more broadly applicable to a lot of the different materials that we're looking at. Um, but the truth is, we're looking at soil less. We, I do not want you to use field soil, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So we'll, un, we'll take a look at what physical properties matter in a potting media, chemical properties, and then we'll take a look at components, so the different types of things that you might see in a potting media bag mix. And, you know, how, as you're making decisions about what you need, um, how you're going to use it. So whether that's in a container or a landscape bed. So we'll think through all of those things. And as you have questions, put them in the Q&A and we will sort through them. I've tried to anticipate a few of the frequently asked questions, if I get frequently asked questions about potting media. Um, and, and we'll go over those at the end. All right, so understanding soil-less substrates. That is what goes in your container there. Um, I, it kind of breaks my heart sometimes when I'm, I'm working with friends who don't know a whole lot about horticulture and they've made a choice based on maybe price or not really understanding what they're purchasing, what's in the bag. And, and I've seen people purchase um, what amounts to you know, concrete to put in their containers and then they, their plants fail and they feel like a failure and feel like they can't grow anything, which is never the case. It's just a matter of knowing a little bit and helping you be a little bit more confident in, in what you're doing as a horticulturist. So that, that leads to the big question, why not soil? I mean, that's what we have. That's what we have access to. It's easy, it's around here. This photo is from the, um, the soil testing lab here at K-State and you can see that there are just a really large variety of soil types and you can get really fine particles, you can get really big chunky ones, you can get some clay all over the board as to what you're putting in that container. The big problem is it's heavy. It's hard to pick up a container that has heavy field soil in it. Sand does a lot of that. It adds weight. It doesn't have enough air space for plants to be able to breathe, for their roots to grow. Um, you know, there you've probably had some experience propagating plants in a cup of water. That's actually uh, a situation that's kind of the exception to the rule. Most of the time, plants really need access to both water and air and nutrients. And if you think about growing them in a container, that is their whole world. They have to be able to get everything they need from what's in that container. They need, um, they need structure, they need air, they need water, they need fertilizer, and um, to be cared for in, the, in that environment. And if they run out of any one of those things, they're gonna tell you immediately by wilting. And then, you know, if you go on vacation and don't have a plan, maybe even dying. And I'm totally guilty of this. I just walked outside yesterday to look at the rain and realized I hadn't watered my plants. So figuring out how that, uh, how to think through that and, and anticipate it will help you be more successful. So field soil also, it, it, so it doesn't have a lot of airspace. It doesn't hold water very well. Um, and it, or it doesn't drain water very well, depending on what kind of soil you've grabbed. If you've grabbed some clay, it's definitely not going to drain or it's going to channel through that potting media. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. Um, and field soil in this capacity does not, in a container, does not hold nutrients as well. It will turn to concrete quickly. So that's a thing to be concerned about. So look at this. 
this, these are really big chunks. And this is a plant that needs a very airy mix. So, you know, as you think through these things, there are some very broad stroke uh, mixes that work fine for a, a whole, for a variety of uses. If you're, as long as you're not using field soil, lots of the pro products will work just fine. But occasionally you do have a plant that needs a different soil environment. And here's a case where this plant really needs big, chunky, coarse pieces of potting media, in this case, pine bark, um, so that it doesn't ever get waterlogged. So these physical properties of a potting media, these big chunks, they dictate how much water and oxygen are available to the root. So I'll show you what that looks like. Um, I'm treating you to a fun photo of me doing my <laughs> doctoral program doing uh, physical properties. So this is where we would take all these different um, mixes uh, so, so what I did was I worked with some forest products that were waste products and figured out whether we could use them to grow nursery crops in. And we had to use this tool called a porometer. And basically you packed it in there and then did some measurements to figure out how much water it would hold. Um, you weighed it, how heavy is it, it is, how much airspace it has. And so this is the scientific tool we use to do that part. It's tedious and takes a long time and you really don't need to know it for your purposes. But I'm trying to explain um, how substrates are different and why you might have different results with different ones. So bulk density is how heavy it is for the volume of space it takes up. In general, you want lighter. Um, lighter weight is better because it's easier to pick up and move around, but you can have too light of a container depending on where you have it. So if it keeps blowing over all the time, you might need to add sand or something to give it some, some weight, some bulk density. So there's, there's different things to take into consideration. There's also airspace. You need enough to allow the roots to grow, but not so much that they don't have anything to hold on to and, and, and get nutrients and water from. So another piece of physical properties is particle size distribution. So in this case, the photo that you're looking at is um, the material that I worked with for my doctoral program. It's, it's wood fiber. We went into the woods, we grabbed uh, material that was left over from timber harvesting where they, they pulled out clean chips to make paper products. And then we would use a hammer mill to grind them to different sizes. So you can see we had a fairly, a somewhat coarse material. It's not super coarse con compared to some of that pine bark that we looked at earlier. And then a couple of really, really fine fibers that do take a lot of processing. But you can see that if you were really to, um, if you were to put these in different settings, they might change the water holding capacity or the drainage or different parts of that. So we would measure the, um, which, the different sizes of particles using a sieve, a sieve shaker that I'll show you here in just a minute. So again, there's no perfect mix. There's lots of good mixes that perform in different ways for different plants. So um, ideally they would change depending on the plant preferences, like if they, if they like to be dry or if they need a lot of water and the size of the container, that makes a big difference, the size and shape. Um, particle nesting, that is something that you might not have thought of, but how these little pieces fit together. If they're highly irregular, then you might have huge gaps of air in the container that cause problems for plant roots trying to get all of the resources that they need to, to survive. And consequently, you might also have in this very fine situation, they nest too closely and they hold too much of those resources for the plant. So this is a sieve shaker. So we would put the sample inside and there's different grates of different sizes through here. And you put it in this little machine. I have one in my lab here on campus and it's in a sound enclosure and no one is allowed to use it during business hours because essentially this big bar just bangs on top of this container and shakes them down for, you know, five minutes at a time for lots of different samples. It's, it, it ends up being a lot. So this is what we're looking at. So I talked about porosity, the, com the 
volume of pore space expressed as a percentage. So you want 50 to 85% pores. And then these macro pores for airspace are the large pores from which water drains during irrigation. And 10 to 30% is ideal. So you don't want too many of the large pores. You want a nice mix in there so that you have some airspace and you have a water reservoir for water to go through. Now, some of my colleagues who are still doing quite a bit of work in substrates have done a ton of work looking at what happens inside this environment. And you have lots of times you will have water will find little channels all the way through these little mixes and go straight out the bottom of the pot. So you may need to change your mix to make sure that it can grab a hold of enough water. So again, that is uh, nursery crop production stuff science that you probably don't need because the, the, the products that you have available to you have already been designed to manage that. Um, so again, can, on physical properties, container capacity or water holding capacity, you want 45 to 65%. And there's a difference between available water or unavailable water. So if the water has, is really um, holding on to the particles in the container and the plant can't take them up unless things get really desperate, um, and, and then enough water that it can take them up. So, but you can see that most of the time you have a saturated area. This is called a perched water table in the bottom of the container, and it changes depending on the size and shape of the container. And you should be, we'll see this in a minute in some containers, you see those roots reach down for the water and they, they circle at the bottom before they come back up and circle at the top. So this is the, the environment that you need to consider. So while you might stick your finger into the top of the pot and think, oh no, it's super dry, it's very possible it's holding a ton of water and it's waterlogged at the base and that's where all the roots headed for and they're drowning. So that sometimes can happen. Um, so I have mentioned a couple times container shape. So taller or wider can change how the water moves and interacts within the confines of the space. So this right here, this is a palm tree in Florida at a nursery. You can see a couple of different container sizes and shapes in this, in this picture. Um, but what I want you to see is this pot, we would call that kind of a squat pot. And it's, a, it's wider than most, which for a palm tree makes a whole lot of sense if you know how their roots grow. But just look at this. I mean, their entire world is in this, this environment and you have to provide everything it needs in order for a tree to get this large. Um, and knowing how the water interacts and sits down here tells you how often you need a water and how, how you need to care for it. So this is from one of my research trials, and this is with a grass. So grasses use tons of water and resources. They fill out a container really fast with their roots. Uh, we had a fair bit of sand in this one, but you can see even in this um, experiment, in both of these treatments, you can see that there is this perched water table at the bottom of the root ball. So that's where it's all, all the water is sitting. So you might think, oh my goodness, it's really dry. Uh, and, and the mix isn't working well, and then still have a, a saturated situation at the base. Okay, let's move on to chemical properties. So you have probably heard a lot about soil pH, and field soil in Kansas is generally high or alkaline. So we're, most of the state, when we get soil test results back, is somewhere in this region. And you know, if you've, if you've ever heard me talk about plant recommendations, you know that I'm always telling you to choose plants that can tolerate a high pH because here, here's the big problem. We get iron chlorosis at these higher pHs, so we need to choose plants that can handle that situation. However, most of the potting media substrates that you get are low. So they're down here. And what you're gonna see are these, um, these, com these additions to the mix that are going to try to raise the pH to get to more of a neutral zone. But I actually think it's a benefit not to have that. So if we, if our soils are already generally up here and, um, and you're thinking about adding some of this material to a landscape bed, for example, then it's already going to be low in pH. And so they're going to try to meet somewhere in the middle and neutralize your pH. But in a container, something that you need to think about is that much of our water is 
alkaline. So it's going to be high pH. So while your potting media may come in at this low pH level over the course of the season or over the course of time in a landscape bed, if you're watering it with water that we have in Kansas with tons of calcium and lime in it, it's slowly going to raise the pH a little bit just because of the environment that we have here. The other part of chemical properties is electrical conductivity or salts. So this usually means if it's too high, it means there's too much fertilizer. So, you know, we're always talking about how much of something is, is a, uh, too much of a good thing. Well, even with plant food, you can give too much and it can burn roots. So you can see even in this particular experiment, the different treatments and, and how you manage plants over time can really make a huge difference on root growth and how happy they are. Um, and you have to think about the fact that if you have too much fertilizer, you can really burn the plant roots and, and that will in turn affect the canopy. Lots of times you may, the, the canopy of the plant may be growing a little bit slower and the, the issue is what's happening in the root zone. And if you can solve what's happening in the root zone, the canopy will recover really well. Conversely, if you don't, if you have low electrical conductivity, it might mean that your potting media is too coarse and the water and the nutrients are leaching out, which can be a problem if you think about any sorts of herbicides or pesticides that you have applied, it, it, can, it can drain that out of the container and not even be used where you applied it. So that's not something that's super easy to test, but if you did have uh, a sample that you got an analysis on, that might explain some of the challenges that you're having. So if you were gonna get a test, how would you test at home? So what we do in nursery crop production, and you know, we, I got a question about this earlier this year. Somebody was thinking, well, do I take what's in the container and grind it up and then send that in as a soil sample? And I would say, no, you don't do that because what you would grind up from a sample that you find in any portion of that container is not going to be representative of the chemical environment in the container. So how do you test at home? In nursery production, we do what's called a pour through procedure. So you can see there's a saucer down here at the bottom, and then this is a PVC ring. You could also use a brick or something that, that will not have a chemical effect on what you're doing. Um, so before you do this pour through, you would water as normally, make sure you give the plant all the water at once, let it sit for an hour, and then set it on top of this scenario and pour just a little bit of water over it so that you can collect about two ounces of leachate. And then you can send that in as a water sample and find out what the environment is. And essentially what happens is that you've watered it, gravity has helped it drain to a normal sort of equilibrium. And then you pour water over and it pushes out whatever water is there. And what comes out the bottom gives you a picture of what's live what's happening inside the container in normal conditions so and that you would only you would only wait for about five minutes to collect that now if you have really large containers where you can't do a situation like this and drain it um, there are some tools like a lysimeter that you can put in the container to help you gather what's happening closer to the bottom but that's a bigger discussion so if you have questions about that reach out to me afterwards and i can help you figure that out um, here's a smaller setup, also doing a pour through on one of my experiments with smaller, a smaller setup, but the same idea. So I realize this sounds like a lot of information. I'm, I'm trying to help you understand the background and the science behind potting medias that you might get. In practicality, um, you know, it's, it's not too difficult to manage these well. But what you need to know is that each component in the mix um, changes both the, chemo the physical and the chemical properties. It could hold more water, which could increase the available water. Um, it could drain better, which could leach pesticides and nutrients. It could be heavier or lighter. It could raise or lower your pH. So if you're mixing your own, you're trying lots of different things, there are any number of things that could affect that and um, make a change. So again, this is gonna go when we talk about usage what kind of, of properties you want to have depending on what you're trying to accomplish with your with your container. So uh, this is just another picture of an experiment that I had. All of these growing at the same time. These were some of our um, alternative potting materials we used here in Kansas. I'm pretty sure that's eastern red cedar. 
And this, so this is more of a, like a standard peat type control. And you know what, the plant's real happy. It's got everything it needs. And in this one, we actually have some anaerobic situations and just tons of water sitting there. Likely because the top inch of it looks super dry, but down below, it's got tons of water and it's, it's not growing well because of that. So being a detective to figure out these things is kind of fun. I, I think that from your perspective, I think potting media bags can be confusing and you might buy field so soil or something of poor quality and not even know it. And, and so what do you look for in those components? So you're, you may see something kind of like this. that has got a mix of, of peat, perlite, vermiculite, uh, or any number of other mixes, you know, maybe even if you're going tobacco transplants and if you're in the South, that happens. This is on a, a professional growing mix. So they have lots of different applications. All right, so here are some soilless substrate components. And this background photo again is from my doctoral work where we were chipping up um, wood for, so we would go from the tree to the pot in a day. Whereas traditionally, um, pine bark really needs to be aged or composted over three to six months, and it takes a lot longer to get that process. And it's entirely possible that growers can run out of supply. So having the access to other alternative materials can help them have a little bit more control over their production cycle. And you know, I'm, I'm really nerdy about substrates and I always get fascinated. I have a gigantic literature review of all the crazy things people have thrown in a pot. And um, I'll list a few of them for you here in a minute, but it, it's extensive and fun. So these are my two PhD advisors. We were in the forest. This was this residual material from when they chipped up um, small caliper trees in the forest for the clean chips to make paper products with. It had to be clean so they'll be white when we have paper to write on. Um, so we used all of this extra material. So this is bark and needles and pine cones and branches and all sorts of stuff. But what you're going to see on a container is either going to be something like bark or composted forest products. And so that's a, that's a really good component. You probably won't know how long it's been composted, um, but you, regionally you're going to see some different tree species. So in the Pacific Northwest, you're going to see Douglas fir bark. Here in Kansas, in the Southeast United States, you're going to see um, pine bark. So loblolly pine generally, but it may differ very depending on what they had access to. So peat, if you look on the bag, this might include the type of peat, which will refer to where it came from, the source material, and most of that is harvested uh, in Canada. And it is a renewable resource. It's just a slowly renewable resource. And the people that um, manage those processes are, are very attuned to the needs of that material. Um, but sometimes I feel like the, the language they use to describe the peat indicates that it's a little bit coarser material. And I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. But in general, peat is a very fine mix. You're gonna see that, mo that's most of what our like small and medium sized containers are made of. And then nursery crop is really gonna be a little bit more on the bark side of things. Um, other major components, you might see them list manure. So here's an example of Daddy Pete's plant pleaser, which is composted cow manure. This was, we had a um, in-vessel digester at Auburn University where I did my PhD and they were composting Cottonburg compost and bagging it up. And it was, a, had a couple of different mixes that we sold from there. So lots of different things can help speed this process. But the critical thing, if you're gonna have be using something like manure is to make sure that it's a clean source. You cannot just go down the road to the feedlot and get what they have. And that's because a lot of times the fields that those animals have been eating off of have had herbicides applied to them. And herbicides can persist through the digestive process. So it's very likely that you can go and get some lovely, beautiful, organic, or not organic, lovely, beautiful, compost, get it home, put it, fill your landscape beds, till it in, plant stuff, and all of it immediately dies because you were not able to confirm that the animals that the manure came from had not been eating 
grass or other material that hadn't been treated with with a herbicide. So if you work with someone who can verify that, you're, you're, you're gold. Um, and usually a bagged product is going to make sure that that is clean too, that there are no differences. Um, I mentioned animal species. I used a lot of different composts in some of my trials and, um, you know, the, the 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 bedding that the animals use is often used as a it can be composted and used in a container i did some work with poultry litter and i was just running my hands through it one day and looked down and realized there were feathers and bones in my hand and had no idea so it was kind of an interesting experience um, and then again we've got these plant composts that can be part of that too but pretty much anything and what i love about local materials as components and mixes is is using what you have available and it's all depending on what kind of industries you have around you that you have access to some sort of waste product that could be used as a component or an amendment to uh to a, a potting media so again on manure you want to make sure it's fully composted if it's not um, it can burn the plant roots because those salts will be really high and it'll 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 um just be hot and also you know some of the trials that I use this poultry litter with they had lots of, of activity in the in the microbial environment and they decomposed really fast so one of the things that I measured was actually substrate shrinkage so how much those containers over the course of, of the growing season went from a full container some of them went down like quite a lot so that's one of the reasons we we often don't use manures as a major component it tends to be an amendment but it's something to think about sand is also something you'll see often i would avoid a product that has a significant amount of sand sand you can achieve elsewhere it's generally for weight um, or if it needs to help provide better drainage and this is something that you might see in propagation in a nursery so where they they really just want the plant to focus on growing new roots and um, otherwise provide its structure so it doesn't hold nutrients very well you have to run uh, provide more for so you might see it as a component but make sure it's not a huge component of the mix so here's, here's my, my little slide about alternative materials. Things you probably will see that are a little bit more mainstream, coconut core, and that's exactly what it sounds like, comes from, it's a byproduct of coconuts. Um, wood fiber, this is what I sort of helped pioneer during my doctoral research that's becoming more and more mainstream. I'm not seeing it in the consumer level products, but I am seeing it in the pretty heavily in the commercial side of things, especially in the greenhouse. And here in Kansas, we chipped up Eastern red cedar and figured out how to grow in it and we can make it work. Um, but so far there haven't been a lot of takers. So we've done lots of other um, interesting in, uh, research that's related to that. And when people are ready for it, we'll be able to, to tell them how to use it. So some of these other fun, um, less common alternative materials, fluff, is um, it's actually garbage that's sort of ground up into this really fine, it almost looks like cotton candy or lint out of your dryer. Tires have been tested. Do not use tires. Don't use tires as mulch. Don't use tires in your containers. It's a bad news bears, bad plan. Um, they, they have a lot, still have a lot of zinc in them and it's, and it's toxic. So um, some other sort of biomass materials, we've used switchgrass, corn stover, poplar, bamboo. If you can chip it up, we'll throw it in a pot and try to grow something in it. One thing I thought was fun in Hawaii, you know, they use what they have locally and they have a lot of volcanic rock in Hawaii. And that's what they grow their horticultural crops in and they know how to use that system. I have a picture of that in just a second that I think is really interesting. And then a couple of crazy ones we tested while I was at Auburn. I didn't have to do this, but it was just interesting. Fish waste, that that was um, fragrant and spent tea grinds because if you've ever been to the South, everybody loves their tea, their sweet tea. I do. I certainly indulged on some sweet tea, but you know, think about all those tea grinds and where they go. So when that load of material to test came in, it smelled amazing at first and then it smelled really gross as it began to decompose, but we tried it. It's always an interesting experiment. So here is Hawaii. 
And you can see this is the volcanic ash that they had in their potting shed. Um, it's, it's got lots of different particle sizes. My guess is that it wouldn't hold nutrients super well, but they've, maybe they add some peat to it to, to increase that capacity. So here's a plant growing in this volcanic ash. They also did cut flower production in ground beds this way. So I thought that was really interesting. So some minor components that you might see. This is perlite. If you see these little white flecks in your potting media, it is there for aeration. It's there to break up those fine peat particles. It's not fertilizer. In fact, it's neutral, it's inert, it doesn't do anything. Um, but, you know, I've, I've had colleagues who told me stories about, um, you know, seeing someone apply an entire bag of perlite to their planting bed and being like, look, I fertilized, I'm taking care of things. But, you know, it, wouldn't cause any damage, but it also really wouldn't help. So if you see someone who thinks that those little white pellets are fertilizer, they are not. Now, control release fertilizer are little pellets. They come in different colors, um, but they will be heavy and not light like this. You might also see vermiculite. These are the shiny heat expanded rock pieces. And again, they're, they're more for um, aeration and chemical and physical properties than, than anything you really need to be concerned about. Um, you might see rice hulls. This is also for aeration, but if you if they apply it, they've done a lot of work in Arkansas about using it as a um, weed control on the top of a container. So you might see that. So it, it's a nice feature if they're able to use that. So some specialty components. You may see a product that um, markets that it has some mycorrhizae in here. Now in a container, this has actually been proven to be very beneficial. So what it does, it's, it is a fungal organism. It's a symbiotic one. So basically it, the organism gets down here in the root and latches into the plant, but it goes and expands the, the reach of the roots so that they can collect more water and more fertilizer. So in a container, this is actually really helpful. Um, if you're if you're going to put it in the landscape it's less helpful because these things are already natively there so um, if you're putting some mycorrhizae in a, in, a, in a landscape because it comes with a plant guarantee that's a nice feature but it's not absolutely necessary because a lot of that's already there you might also see a fungicide product um, and that's generally more on the production side but they're designed to address other specific fungal problems that you want to not have Mycorrhizae, yes. Fungus, other, other fungal problems, no. <laughs> All right, so I talked about pH manipulators earlier. You're going to see on almost every bag I looked at this spring, I saw lime. Guess what we have plenty of in Kansas? Lime. It's already in it. If we instead are generally looking to lower the pH, in which case we would want something like aluminum sulfate or sulfur, um, but that you're pretty much not going to see uh, a bagged material that has this in it. You'll see lime. Um, you, this is something you'll have to apply separately. So just a moment to uh, just a, a question about organic. Um, most of the media components are considered natural and likely produced using organic practices, but lots of people don't go through with the process of being labeled it for it because the certification process costs a lot of money and a lot of time. Um, but I just want to tell you that organically labeled products are not inherently better than others. Um, <clears throat> they might help ensure manure products are free from herbicide use, but otherwise, um, this picture that I have here is a product that I wouldn't recommend. It, it is a low cost product available locally um, at a big box retailer, but the quality of what's in there and the information that they provide on the bag about what's in there is, is limited. So I wouldn't feel super comfortable with that product. So, um, and it might have other problems when you open it up. So it, it's not good or bad, um, but it is a label and some, some information for you. All right, oh, I went too far. So now we're gonna switch gears and talk about how you're gonna use them. So you know what, what the physical and chemical properties are. So you know how those components are shifting around inside and changing things. And you know how, what some of those materials might be. And now you need to decide how you're gonna use it. So this is actually a load of compost uh, a friend of mine delivered 
from um, campus and it's from campus food waste um, in the in the dining facilities which are not operating at the moment and it's fairly old and it's this it's I haven't spread it out yet and it's covered in weeds and it's very sad <laughs> but I have it and it's for amending my landscape beds so here's the main piece if you have a small or medium-sized container you want to choose a fine material something that's primarily peat with some lar larger chunks for aeration so most of the products that you can buy on the shelf are are easy peasy gonna gonna check this box as long as you're buying something that that is quality larger containers you want something that's pine bark based for better drainage so the larger container you get the more you you need for that what's in it not to just seize up into one you know really fine interlocked pieces you want it to be uh, drainable so here's another here's an example uh, of a really large container that you would want to focus on like normally this is an annual so you might think that it needs a peat based material but with a larger container i would go with pine bark based extra large containers this is this is often when you see woody plant material like trees and shrubs in really big containers this is actually a nursery um, but you might see plants that are going to be conceivably be in the container for a long time so those depending on how like the continually how bigger bigger the planter gets definitely need to be pine bark based but you might want to also make sure that they have larger like a component of pretty large nuggets in there to make sure that the aeration is good uh, here's another example of a container and you can see there's this is probably mulch on top but this definitely should be a pine bark based material that is is getting plenty of water and fertilizer and irrigation now like whoa big that's real big this is this is at a nursery but you can imagine if you put peat in this to grow a tree in first of all the tree wouldn't have enough structure it would probably blow over um, but it needs something a little bit heavier, a little bit coarser that drains well in a container that large. All right, landscape beds. This is my daughter Lola. She's my constant companion. She goes everywhere and she mostly wears pajamas all day these days. Um, so she's in lots of these pictures. This is my front flower bed that I finally got around to uh, doing something with this, spring, this, this summer, I guess. Um, we moved here a year ago and the, the builder had put a bunch of rocks in here and it took me forever to get all those rocks out. Um, and what I was left with was kind of a mucky mess. So I knew that I needed to amend it. So for landscape beds, if you're thinking about what you need here, you need to find out what your soil is and what it needs. It probably needs some better aeration, maybe some more organic matter. It probably doesn't need all of those uh, vermiculite and perlite. It doesn't need things like that. And if you did, you would want to make sure you mix it into the entire bed so that you don't get the soup bowl effect. Like if, if what you've, you've planted a tree, you always want to go back with the native soil or till up the entire bed and mix it with some added pieces so that you don't have a different environment in that planting hole to cause water to pool up. So get a soil test um, and come up with your fertilizer strategy for how you're going to manage that. We'll talk about that more in just a second. Now, I did actually buy some topsoil to put in that bed. And in this case, I picked a product that was regional and came from regional areas. And I also mixed in some cotton bird compost. That's what they had available in bags that I could lift and carry and put on top of there. And then I tilled it in. And then I got a big rock stuck in there in my electric tiller. Don't laugh. Um, and as always, Lola is my constant companion. So I tilled that in a few times and made sure it was really well mixed and smoothed off the top of it. And um, note to self, taking a five-year-old shopping for plants, you come home with a lot of weird stuff that is challenging to figure out what to put in a container. But we figured it out and we planted some stuff. So this was fairly early on after we, we planted our containers and our landscape beds. And um, then this was this morning. So you can see Constant Companion had to come out and be in the picture. And there's my compost pile full of weeds that I need to manage, <clears throat> my husband keeps telling me. So again, filled out really, really well. I did come along after about a month and tossed on some um, 
control release fertilizer pellets that had a fairly long life and that has just done wonders they've filled in beautifully so you so what i want you to know about fertilizer is that if you're buying a potting mix i can pretty much guarantee it has a starter charge of fertilizer in it so it already has some fertilizer mixed in to get you started um, and then it might also have some control release fertilizer which are the little pellets um, and so those will come into play later during the season and you may need to do some liquid feed to to feed them until they get to that point make sure you read the label rate for these products and don't over apply and you'll be in good shape so watering watch your plants pick them up I, you know i actually didn't have a greenhouse course before i went to work on my phd and i ruined an entire research project because I didn't know how to water. And I learned how to water after that point, you know? I just watered every day because they said water every day. And they came in and looked at it and they lifted the pots and they were just soaking wet. I completely overwatered because I wasn't watering based off of plant need. I was watering off of a schedule. So take a little bit to, to decide if your plants actually need any water. If it's a situation where you can apply drip irrigation, Doremi, you should do that. Um, it's even better if you can add some fertilizer via injection, but that's, that's, that's in the advanced category of life. So if you're not quite ready for that, don't feel bad. And you know, on top of that, nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. We've all killed a plant. It's fine. We're all fine. I promise you, you're not gonna, it's not gonna be the end of the world if you kill a plant uh, through any of these means. So just looking at containers, I, I thought this one was really funny. Um, tics, tips for spectacular results. So the marketing on the, these things are, are pretty wild, but the key here, you have to kind of dig to see the ingredients. So this is where you're gonna see reed sedge peat, which to me means it's coarser, aged forest products, composted pine bark, composted rice hulls, or peanut holes, uh, sphagnum peat moss, so that's finer, perlite, lime, a wetting agent because peat moss can get kind of dry and a time to release fertilizer so this kind of has all the bells and whistles um, this one a little bit more simple reed sedge peat composted forest products and com or composted rice hulls peat moss lime and that's it and then they regionally tell you that, that it might change in different states which is kind of interesting this one has perlite wetting agent fertilizer this one um, 15 to 25% Canadian sphagnum peat moss, then a different source for humus, perlite, limestone, slow, slow release fertilizer. And then this one over here has a wetting agent and, and in addition to uh, a starter fertilizer. So those are labels that you might see. This one I got super excited about. It's peat moss based. Um, I don't know why you would want that in your lawn, but that's where they were marketing it. And then I saw this pH adjusted with limestone, which in Kansas is not what we need. Um, so again, this one, 65 to 75% processed pine bark. So if you've got a bigger container, look for those keywords. Um, and then there'll be a, you know, some regional information, a little bit different stuff. This one worries me. This is the cheapest one and it barely tells you anything it tells you there's a little bit of aged softwood and aged hardwood a little bit high percentage i would say and aged pine bark so this is the actual wood and not the pine bark and sand it's very simple there's no fertilizer in it and i think that's where people get confused when they put it in their container and it doesn't have a starter charge in it so your fertilizer is going to be a problem now this is one that was at an independent garden center. It had quite a bit more information. It was from a commercial grower, Sun Grow, commercial provider, Sun Grow, and has lots more information um, for, for what you're getting in the bag. And this is available to consumers. So, you know, knowing what the brands are is important, but it's not the end all be all. So this is one that sort of caught my eye. And you know, Miracle Grow is a good company. But I think this bag, this little bitty bag, uh, 1.3 cubic feet was like 10 or 12 or $15. I can't remember. And I just thought it was interesting to look at the marketing because first of all, they've, they've bothered to, to give it a premium price. It's organic. Um, but it did tell you it's for in-ground soil. It does not say it's for a container. 
and they emphasize something like a pepper that might be grown in a um, a garden bed type situation. So there's more information on the back and I thought it was very educational, but that premium price is mostly marketing and packaging. So knowing what you're looking for will help you make good decisions. So to summarize, when you're choosing, read the ingredient label to know what you're getting. Are you getting peat? You're getting pine bark. Are you not getting any starter, starter fertilizer? Find out what you need for your application and then decide what best meets your needs and your budget. So I'm a pretty budget conscious person, but I'm somewhere in the middle. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to buy the cheapest and I'm not going to buy the most expensive. And I think you can be really smart about it. All right, so if um, Brooke or someone could launch the, the second poll, this is me and my friend Brian Jackson from North Carolina, North Carolina State University, and we totally nerd out on how nurseries mix potting media. And you can see all the different products that they have added, including this green color is a um, fertilizer pellet. Um, it's, a, it's a brand that, that goes with the green, but they've got peat and pine bark and some other fine material, and they're mixing it with a truck. So I'm going to let you guys keep doing that for a second while we move on. There's a few other frequently asked questions I'll try to answer in case they've been asked in the chat box. Can I use an old bag of media? Well, as in most horticultural answers, the answer depends. So you want to check the moisture content. If it's peat, it may have dried out and you may need to take some time to really mix in some water get it re-wetted, you might need to add a re-wetting agent, but usually you can just put it in the wheelbarrow or a bucket and mix it with water and just mix, mix, mix. Um, it probably doesn't have any fertilizer left. It's probably all gone. Um, if fungi are present, it could be a problem. This kind of fungi I wouldn't worry about so much, but there is a hydrophobic fungi that can, if it gets in your potting media, can prevent it from taking up water. And then that, that you just need to throw out or, or put it out in a landscape bed where it can be tilled in. Um, the next one, um, can I reuse potting media? Well, maybe, again, be smart about it. This picture is, is how we manage this at, on campus. So we have these steam sterilizer trays that so we can reuse potting media if we want to, but generally it's best to start fresh. Um, but just know that you may have, oops, I went too far. You may have pests or diseases that persist from year to year. You may have fungi. You maybe you might need a rewetting agent. You may probably have lost fertilizer. And um, there are some other choices that might be better for that. And then start fresh for your containers. All right, so with that, I have talked for much longer than I thought I would, and I keep seeing off the side lots of questions. So um, if I could be asked those, I will do my best to answer them. Thank you, Cheryl, for sharing your wonderful knowledge on potting media and sharing your love for this topic. Um, I know that we have a lot of questions to cover, so I'll turn it over to Kelsey. Um, we'll begin our question and answer and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can up until one. Yes, Cheryl, we have a lot of good questions. The first one is, can you recommend a good potting mix for a raised bed vegetable garden? It just depends on what you have locally. So you need to go to the garden center, have a look at it. It depends on what kind of raised bed. So I actually deleted a photo of an elevated bed where the actual area on top was two or three feet above the ground and in that case I still think you're probably going to get something with peat and pine bark and it, it it truly depends on what you have available locally and that varies from retailer to retailer. Hey what composition should be a good potting medium that isn't going to stain your front porch? Stain your front porch. Um I mean, that probably depends on the, the material that your front porch is made of. I, I don't know that there's staining is a big concern for, for most of, of what I'm covering. I would imagine if it, any staining that I have seen is something that can be removed with pressure washing. So uh, I don't know that there's anything that's super targeted towards that. 
Um, and likely it's coming from fertilizer or hard water deposits from our alkaline water, be my guess. Okay. They, um, someone else is having a problem with watering their container plants where the top of the soil is dry, but the lower half is waterlogged. Do you have suggestions for how to correct that via soil types or watering techniques? So <laughs> my colleague from Georgia is trying to call me. Um, Again, that's, that's kind of something that happens when you mix it in the beginning and you're trying to get it into a good situation for, for long-term season success. But if you've got that right now and you're trying to figure it out, um, I think I might switch for a bit to more, generally we, we like to re recommend less frequent, very deep waterings. But if it's possible that you've got a perched water table at the bottom of your container and it's really dry at the top and it's mid season and you don't wanna make any changes, you could potentially put a little bit of a mulch material on it. Maybe you can find some composted rice holes or some pine bark or something to put on top to help retain it. And then maybe for a little while water more frequently but less to make sure that while your plants are getting established, they do get enough water. Um, and then maybe try switching to a different material for that size and shape of container for next season. Going along that side, is it healthy for potted plants to be watered with tap water? Sure, no problem. Okay, does perlite ever break down? Um, I'm sure that it does, but I don't know what that long, like how long it will take. I've seen it persist for more than a year. So um, if you're gonna, it does, you don't really need it in a landscape bed, but if you were gonna dump out this year's, when you're done with this season's potting media and it has perlite in it and you mixed it into a landscape bed, I imagine it would be gone in a, a couple of years and not cause any problems at all. Okay, with a pine bark based mix, what percentage of pine bark to other main base materials do you recommend? Oh, that's fun. Okay, so with pine bark, you want it to be the major component. If you're gonna have some sort of amendment, I almost always say the amendment needs to be no more than 25%. So then you're looking at, you know, anywhere between 50 and 75% pine bark, depending on if you add more than one amendment. So I would go pretty heavy with pine bark, at least half, maybe up to 75%. Okay. Um, someone else has been told to water potted plants from the bottom. She was told that way the soil would absorb it where it's needed. She has drip trays that are under her plants that have been watered. Is that with a great success? Is this a good method? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there are especially a lot of house plants that kind of prefer that. So it depends on, again, it's plant specific. What are you growing? Um, what are you, what size of container? Where, what environment is it in? Um, you know, I really like the self-watering planters where they have a reservoir at the bottom because I'm lazy and I don't like to water them all the time. Um, but if they're really big containers and you've just planted things, those roots haven't reached down to get to that reservoir yet. So you still have to water on top until the roots reach down and get it. But if it's an established plant, um, but yeah, that's where a lot of those roots are circling and looking for resources. Do you have any research about using coffee grounds as a potting soil amendment similar to tea? Yes, um, a colleague of mine did do some coffee grind work it's not pretty. <laughs> so uh, it's not one I would recommend. I think, eh, I'm not even sure if I would say to do it at like 5%. Um, it's, it's a little bit too, the, the acid is, is kind of a problem with that one. So I would avoid coffee grounds unless you're adding it to a bigger compost pile and then the big compost pile is gonna go into a landscape bed. That's probably fine, but not in a container. Can you describe what a wetting agent is and which, what kind do you suggest using? Um, I actually don't know of any brands off the top of my head, but a wetting agent is a material that sort of hold, grabs onto water and keeps it in place. So 
have, have you ever seen like hydrogel where you it's it just holds on to water you put plant roots in it like if you're going to buy a bare root plant you might put it in that to store it until you get home um a re-wetting agent is something that's going to help the potting media uh hold water and so it's probably going to be a bagged or a small container type product that you would um, shake over your potting media as your so if you've got this old potting media you think it's dry and it's not holding water you go get this re-wetting product you add it to the top put some water on and just mix it as much as you can with your hands until you feel like it's finally holding water there's okay. probably better instructions for that on the bottom on the container what is the best soil for cactus type plants Okay, so that's a really good point. So when Ariel talked about houseplants earlier in the season, um, she was talking about the different mixes that you might need for indoor plants. And for cacti, you do actually need, it's one of those plants that really prefers a drier mix. And so you need generally need something coarse or, um, or like a kind of a sandy mix that's not gonna hold a, a lot of nutrients and water. I mean, think about when, where cacti grow. They really like dry environments, so they prefer to be dry. So that is one of those cases where they do have those um, special mixes for cacti and, and those type of plants if it's gonna be an indoor long-term type situation. And I would go ahead and purchase those. They're really good ideal for that situation. If it's gonna be outside, like a larger plant in a bigger container, like you've got a gigantic century plant or something, those can take a pine bark mix that's really coarse. So that's what I would advise. Okay, that was probably the, all the time we had, but one last participant wanted you to know that this was phenomenal information. Oh, wow, thanks. Somebody cared about substrates, I'm excited. <laughs> okay, I could probably stop sharing my screen. Are we gonna go ahead and end the meetings. Anybody have anything else to add? Yeah. What, once again, thank you for joining our K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. We're, we are so glad that you came or were attended today to learn more about potting soil. We have several awesome webinar series coming up. Be sure to vis visit our website to see all the upcoming topics. I think next week's is fall gardening. Um, this section will be recorded and posted by tomorrow afternoon on the same website that we mentioned earlier. After the webinar ends today, you should receive a prompt uh, to take an evaluation survey, and we'd appreciate if you would fill that out. And um, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us at ksuemg at ksu.edu. Thanks. <laughs>